Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Welcome back to the program again this week, and I trust you have been tuning in every week. Some powerful things have been happening. Uh, as Jeremy and I, I, I have been sharing some things about prayer and prayer from the secret place, the most holy place, and uh, Jeremy's been a guest with me for the last couple of weeks and will be for another week or two, and so we welcome you back to the program, Jeremy. This is my oldest son, Jeremy, and he pastors a great church in Winchester, Virginia called Word That Frees. Uh, they meet on Boundary Road. Uh, if you go to their website, which there'll be some information on the screen, uh, where you can go and be a part of one of their meetings on Monday night is when they meet at this point, and uh, he has planted a church there, and it's in its first stages, so uh, come be a part. You really, really, really enjoy his teaching. As you can tell from what he shares on the program. Uh, let me say again that if you have uh, missed any of the programs, this will be the third segment that we have uh, that we are going to uh, talk about. Matthew six. We're also going to talk about that same version of it in Luke's gospel today. But if you missed any of it, you can go back to our YouTube page and uh, watch it on demand on any of your devices, or you can get the uh, podcast, go to get our podcast on iTunes, and it has the audio portion of uh, what we have been teaching. We want to jump back in the Word today without a lot of advertisement uh, and tell you that we've been teaching once again from Matthew 6, and, and uh, we've been teaching from uh, where he said, uh, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, not your righteousness, but His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The, all these things that are added, the reason we don't get all these things is because we don't believe into righteousness. The uh, weapon of condemnation and guilt that's formed against us because we've not been established in the word of righteousness, which the Bible calls milk. I believe that we need to be established and exercised in the word of righteousness, knowing that our righteousness is not based on our performance, but it's based on a gift. That when we understand that, that we can pray effectual, fervent prayers because we are righteous. And the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. God is no more interested in a no, another glow-in-the-dark preacher or evangelist than, uh, any, than anything. He's looking for normal people everywhere to begin to grasp their identity and flow from this place where we know that we can pray effectual, fervent prayers. And so we ended the segment last week. I didn't even have time to, you know, really have a sign-off. We were praying, and I believe God touched a lot of people last week when we were ministering to them. I just believe healing was released all through the airways. But when he says here in Matthew 6, he said, When you pray, enter your closet and then shut the door. And your Father which sees in secret will reward you openly. And we've already done a lot of stuff about vain repetitions and all the stuff that goes with that. But simple thought today that we're going to launch from there and go into Luke 11 and read this version uh, from uh, a different gospel. But when I think about when you enter into the secret place, we talked about last week how the secret place or the closet is not necessarily a room in your house, but it's that place, uh, first of all, of intimacy and being alone with God. But when I think about the secret place, it's almost like an icon to me that says, pay attention here. He's talking about the secret place of the Most High. And I shared last week how that Psalm 91 said, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say, Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. He will cover me with His feathers, under where our wings we come to trust. And He goes on in that psalm to say, we don't have to worry about the raging epidemics. We don't have to worry about the terror. Uh, we don't have to worry about, because only with your eyes shall you see it, and behold the reward of the wicked. And when I think about the secret place, Again, I'll just say by way of review, what is the secret place? To most people, that's a riddle or an enigma. But when I think about the secret place of the Most High, I think about John chapter 20. When, you know, uh, Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, Mary goes to the tomb early on resurrection morning. And when she stoops down and she looks into the tomb, she sees an angel standing at the head and an angel standing at the foot of where Jesus had lain. It is a perfect picture 
of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord or the mercy seat. Because when Psalm 91 says you can trust what's under his feathers, the only place God has feathers is on the mercy seat. And so when he's saying you can trust what's under his wings, what was under the wings of these cherubims in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It was called our propitiation is the Greek word mercy seat. So Jesus was the fulfillment of what the Old Covenant, Ark of the Covenant, was only a shadow of. Mm -hmm. The Old Covenant is a shadow. The New Covenant is the substance. The Old Covenant was, you know, uh, the type, and, and the New Covenant is the reality. Jesus was the fulfillment. So when I think about praying from the dimension of the secret place, I think about praying from the viewpoint of the done deal and what he's done in his finished work. If the blood of sprinkling has dealt with my sin, it's covered me. It's, 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 it dealt with all of my, like I said last week, healing scripture is set up by saying he was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement for my peace was on him. By whose stripes we are healed. So the, the fourth thing he says is healing. But he has to, I believe, show you how he dealt with all of the hindrances of your healing. Mm -hmm. By showing he was wounded, he was bruised, he was chastised. And even the next verse in Isaiah 53, we all like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us have gone into our own path. So if it was based on us deserving it, nobody gets it. Yeah. But uh, when we pray from that viewpoint, we can pray in faith knowing, you know, that God has done something. Jump in there a little bit and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Luke 11 in a little bit. Well, you know, when you talk about even... Uh our faith and, and things that, uh, again, we, I think la last time we were together, we began to talk about the importance of understanding identity. Uh, the scripture will say, you know, that uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I was saying la at the end of the last program, you know, sometimes our conformity, we've been taught that's all sin. Like, you know, if you're you're, you're being conformed to this world is every time you, you sin or something, and instead we need to be transformed. But I, I think sometimes, too, even we'd look at, because we're so surrounded by the wor mm -hmm. world anymore, and especially uh, nowadays with technology and everything, it's like Facebook or social media, uh, the 24-hour medias, we are so bombarded with the world and mm -hmm. what's happening in the world. And, and then it's, you know, it's like we're so connected to, to people all the time that we get, we see all the bad reports, mm -hmm. you know, so it's every time somebody gets a negative report, that's, you, we look at others well, and somebody else got, yeah, and so after a while, we just think if the bad report comes to our door, it's almost like we receive it and go, man, this is just, that's just how life I'm is. I'm getting just, older and this is I'm what you I'm getting older expect, and this is yeah. what's happening and this is just, you know, this is just what part of life is and we're, we end up being conformed yeah. to receive that rather than being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And again, some of it is because we, even in our churches, we've not been hearing, we've been hearing really a message of conformity rather than a message of transformation, uh, where we, we, you know, we're, we're looking to conform to the religious system. And that doesn't, even our conformity to a religious system doesn't produce like a transformation of our mind. In other words, what transforms our mind is understanding our identity in Christ, understanding how He changed us from sinners to righteous. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we've been talking from this scripture that it's, it's, it's the seek ye first the kingdom in his righteousness. Not our own, our own righteousness, it's his righteousness and understanding the identity of what Christ has already made us mm -hmm. perfect. He's already made us righteous. We've already been made uh, in his image. That uh, uh, I always like to say the scripture says that he that knew no sin was made to be sin so that I might be made the righteousness mm -hmm. of God. Uh, I, was, I took on the identity of Christ because I identified with what he did in his death, burial, and resurrection. Yep. Just like under the old covenant when they would take that spotless lamb, they would lay their hands upon it. They were identifying that this lamb now that was once spotless takes my spots. But now that this spotless lamb, i am become spotless because of the transformation, the identity that we're trans transferring here. So, so in Christ, that's what we did is we identify what Jesus did on the cross. And we are identifying that he took my sin so I could take his righteousness. Mm -hmm. He took my death so that I could take his life. He took my sickness so I could take the healing. Mm -hmm. That's what we're identifying with. Mm -hmm. And so when we go into our closet, when we identify, uh, we're being, in other words, the more we begin to understand that transformation and understand 
uh, that it's his righteousness, not my own righteousness, then I'm being transformed by the renewing of my mind. Uh, one of the things that uh, Paul used to say, because you were talking about the secret place, and you know that's like, when we talk about the secret place, it's like a mystery to people. Uh, Paul would say, here's the mystery that's been mm -hmm. hidden from ages. You know, and so we, you know, we hear the word mystery and we think it's all spooky, but Paul tells you st straight out what the mystery is. It's Christ in you, the mm -hmm. hope of glory. When you realize the identity of Christ in you, all the mystery begins to be unraveled mm -hmm. and all the things you've been hoping for, all the things you've been really, you know, crossing your fingers are going to happen. Those things begin to be released to you because you understand who you're connected to. Uh, you understand your identity as a son, that no longer are we asking as slaves, what we're asking as sons. Uh, John would say that, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we might be called the sons of God. So when we begin to understand, except we don't really, we haven't been transformed by that renewing of our mind. We still don't think like sons. We still think like sinners. We still think like we're outside of God's good graces. We still think that He's secretly got, got it out for us or something. And rather than being transformed to understand, hey, I'm a, I need to put myself in a mindset of what a son is. Mm -hmm. Because there's things, and I, I know you're going to share this, but there are certain things that when a son asks, mm -hmm. things begin to change. And so when you go into your closet or when you go into that secret place or that, that time of prayer, you go in there not with a conformity of the world of I've really got to beg God to do something, but you need to go in with a mindset mm -hmm. of that I'm a son and that there are some things that I have access to, that the kingdom's already here. And if I just walk into the kingdom, there's some things I can have because it's available to me because I'm a son. Yeah. And I'm not having to beg for it to happen. I just walk in and with that mindset, God begins to release some stuff to us. Uh, like you, you, you said last set, uh, or, cup, or in one of the, s the sessions we've been in is that uh, in the old covenant, the children of Israel, he, he, he said, you know, there was not a feeble one amongst them. Yep. There, that sin had, our, our sickness had no part in yep. them. They were living. Yep. They were, you know, they were, they were eating good. They yep. were, you know, uh, God was blessing them. And that was under an old covenant system. How much more in this day as we've been made something like Paul, John would say, we've been made sons. How much more as sons? Can we receive the goodness of God in our lives? And things begin to change in us. And I think, like I said, the more we begin to renew our mind into that kind of mindset, it becomes effortless to receive the goodness of God. The, we said uh, last, last session, uh, consider the lilies. They don't toil. They don't spin. They're not trying to make it happen. They're not trying. In, they're not really hoping they're going to grow. They grow and they 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 and are do it and, without toilet and they're arrayed in beauty. Yeah. At, at, without without any kind of effort because it's in their nature to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, what if we begin to understand it's in our nature to live? It's in our nature to be blessed. It's in our nature to receive the kingdom. It's in our nature to uh, like the book of Revelation would say, have all the tears wiped from our eyes, eat from the the leaves of uh, of the tree of life. That's for the healing of nations. To to be uh, not just uh, consumers of the kingdom, but also be producers of the kingdom. That we begin to give it to others. We begin to speak the words of life. That begin to, to awaken other men to the identity of what they can have. Uh, you know, I believe that it, not just that God wanted to to give us some healing, but he wants to put healing on our tongues and on our lips that we begin yeah. to speak life to other people Absolutely. that begins to awaken them to their identity to receive the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And it comes not by being conformed to the world of saying, well, this is just how life is and this is what I've got to expect, but we been, begin to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, by hearing our identity, and then put us in a posture to receive what God really wants to open up and give to us freely. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, I think of many times of the for instance, where Jesus comes to the man sick of a palsy, and he says to him, Son, thy sin be forgiven thee. And the carnal mind of those scribes and Pharisees went out of the safety zone. And uh, who does this man think he is to forgive sin? And Jesus said, which is easier to say, Thy sin be forgiven thee, arise, take up your bed and walk. So, and, and I always thought, now what is, you know, I, I could never see the connection, but really the connection here is that Jesus knew that if he would remove this man's sin consciousness, he would set him up for a miracle. Because most people, when they get a bad report, the first thing they think is either the judgment of God is on me, I did something wrong, uh, this is God punishing me. We can't figure out half the time, is it God or the devil? Yep. You know, and it's really pitiful. Because every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness or turning of shadow. 
simply this, devil bad, God good. That's our theology, <laughs> you know. And, uh, but God is good and He's good all the time. But here's the thing that I think Jesus was doing with that. He said, son, I sent me forgiven thee. Because He knew that probably what was crippling this man in his faith was his sin consciousness. So the moment he removes his sin consciousness, he sets him up for a miracle. Mm -hmm. I think of it again, and I've maybe shared this a little bit in one of the other segments. In James, he says, is there any, sin, any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let him anoint him with oil, pray the prayer of faith. And if he has committed any sin, God throws that if he has committed any sin in there to show you that not even your sin can stop God from healing you. That's, somebody needs to hear that today. Yep. I'm not suggesting it's all right to sin. I'm just saying... You know, somebody said, well, for instance, one time, if you smoke, don't get in my prayer line. Well, that's a slippery slope. You know, if you're not going to pray for somebody that smoked and got sick, then don't pray for somebody that ate too much pie. Yep. Uh, see, you know, in other words, you know, we want to pick and choose which one, you know, because all of us are in the shape we're in because we've done something stupid. Mm -hmm. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. But that doesn't stop God. I'm not suggesting we don't have stewardship or any mm -hmm. of those things with our bodies that we need to kind of pay attention to. But again, that comes that that stuff comes too, also by yeah. renewing our mind, by realizing yeah. our identity. The sin easily falls off the more we begin to realize that we're not sinners; exactly we're righteous. Right. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that, 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 that what we're preaching about righteousness yeah. don't believe you and in your it, sin. It, the, the scripture says the sin will no longer have any hold over you because yeah. you're not under the law, but right. you're under grace. That's right. So the more we begin to understand our identity, it, the sin doesn't Absolutely. can't have no hold. So even the things that has beset us are the yeah. things that begins to to fall off and, and begins to put us again back into a posture to receive the goodness exactly. of God. Exactly. And then James goes on to say, and this is powerful to me, he says, you know, if he has committed his sin, it will be forgiven to him. For Elijah was a man. Boom. Just stop him up. He was a man. Now we think about the man of God as being the guy flew in on an airplane with a suitcase full of miracles. And we don't believe the man of God is set beside me or the woman of God is my wife or, mm -hmm. you know, we, for, we, 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 we just, we, see, we idolize people we don't know. But he points out his humanity. Elijah was a man. And then it says this, of like passions as we are. He had the same struggles you got. You know, people will say to my wife a lot of times, they'll say, uh, it must be incredible to live with this great man of God, you know. And, you know, does he prophesy over you all the time? And she's like, uh, no, not necessarily. <laughs> you know? In other words, he's just a man like you are yep. that God uses. And she, he's, he was a man of like passions as we are. And he prayed and God heard his prayer. But here's the good news. Elijah was just a man of like passions under the old covenant. In the new covenant, we're more than just a man. Yep. We're men and women full of the Holy Ghost, and we're the sons of God. Yep. And if we're sons of God, then we've got authority. And I believe that's one of the reasons he's telling us to pray, because he tells him, you know, your father knows you need this before you ask. But what he's doing is, and many times Jesus said, Father, I'm not saying this before these people, you know. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying this so they'll know that I'm your son, that you're, yep. you know, that they'll, so that they'll believe. In other words, there's some things that we need to walk in authority of and make some declarations over, hurt the Holy Spirit, say we need to be proactive instead of reactive. We wait till something hits us rather than make some declarations mm -hmm. and, and move on over it. Let me, let me, let me if I, uh, at least introduce this in this particular se segment, um, if, uh, if I can get my iPad here to work. But I want to read this, this uh, text from uh, the book of St. Luke, and we'll, we'll unpack this in the next segment too as well. It says, and it came to pass, this is the Luke's version of Matthew 6. It says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples, he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so in earth, give us day by day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend shall go unto him at midnight and say unto the friend, Lend me three loaves? For I have a, a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. I think one of our problems is, well, a lot of us have got friends that are in this journey, and we don't have nothing to give them, especially when it comes to three loaves of bread. And that'll <laughs> preach just in itself there, is the three loaves of bread. But we have people in a journey, and we're not serving them anything. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot arise and give thee. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him, because, his, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as much as he needs. In other words, because he's going to continue to wear you out 
Everybody got a friend like that. <laughs> you finally take his call because you just, you know, he ain't going to give up to he go, you know, you ain't going to get no rest. And then he says, I say unto you, ask, it shall be given you. Seek, you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. For everyone that asks receives. He that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will, if, 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 if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So that's a key to this verse. But what he's saying here, and we preach this like, boy, you're going to have to just wear God out. You know, because if you just keep, you're going to bombard the gates of heaven, you just keep bothering him. And what happens is if you just keep on bombarding God, he's going to, out of your importunity because you're mm -hmm. persistent, he's going to give it to you. That's totally the opposite of what this is saying. Yeah. He's saying, you know what? This friend, if he being evil, is going to finally get up and give to you because you keep on till you wear him out. And he's saying like this, your father is much better than that. First of all, he wants you to have it. Yep. So he's not holding back anything from you. But what he's saying here is, is that, you know, if, if, if this guy uh, is going to finally give to you, he said, then, you know, how much more your heavenly father is going to respond. And then what, what, and this brings us back to the thing about identity again. If a son will ask for bread. You know, will he give him a serpent? I wrote a few things in my notes, so we'll probably unpack this a little bit more. But I, I put this in my notes. If a son shall ask bread. See, remember, the prayer Jesus just prayed is, give us this day our daily bread. Mm -hmm. Well, the bread that we ask for is more than just physical bread. The bread that we ask for, he said, if he asks for bread, will you give him a stone? Well, we know that according to the scripture, that bread is really talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. He said, I am the true bread that came down from heaven, that if a man will feed on this, you know, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and those rascals are dead. We also know that according to Corinthians, that the communion, uh, the, the broken, this is my body. It was broken for you. In other words, you can receive healing, and then this is just so blesses yeah. me. Because if you're asking, if a son's asking for bread, he's asking for more than just a sandwich here. Yep. He, he, he said, if, he's asked, if this is my body, it was broken for you. And the communion of Corinthians is not about disqualifying you. It's about his death is what qualified you. Yep. So when you ask for bread, he's not going to give you the stone of the law. In other words, see, this is like you said in an early segment. This is him shifting the whole paradigm. It's the transformation of mm -hmm. your mind from an old covenant paradigm to a new covenant. Because in the new covenant, a son, Jesus, has asked, give them their daily bread. Give them a daily yep. supply of the life and supply, just like you did in the wilderness. Give them the matter. I will bless their bread. I'll bless their water. I'll remove sickness from among them. The bread, Jesus says in the new covenant, your fathers ate man in the wilderness. They're dead. But it, I'm the true bread that came down from heaven. So when we ask for bread, we're asking for more than a sandwich. We're asking for his qualification. We're asking for his daily supply of the word. Even when he says in Romans, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word God there, if you put it in your inner linear Bible, is not theos. It's Christos, which is Christ. The word about Christ. So when we get on a steady diet of the word about Christ, our faith goes to another level. Yep. He said, if you ask for fish, would you give him a serpent? And I wrote in my notes about fish, I wrote, remember the story of Jonah. The story of Jonah, Jesus said, there'll be no sign given except the son of Jonah. For even as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so must the son of man be three days, three nights in the belly of hell. And we know that really what Jonah is a picture of is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so if you're asking for fish, you're asking for more than a sandwich. Yep. You're asking for a supply of the fact that, hey, he even took your rebellion like he took Jonah's rebellion. And he, did, he took it down into the depths of the sea. But when he came back up, I think it's not an accident, Jeremy, that the first thing that happens is he's on the Sea of Tiberias and the disciples are coming in and Jesus has bread and fish on the fire. Yep. Because he's going to give them some fish. He's going to give them a steady diet of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then he even turns around. I think this is phenomenal. He says, Simon, 
son of Jonah. He calls Peter the son of Jonah. Well, Jonah, again, is the story of the death bearer. Simon, here's your new identity. <laughs> You're, you are a son of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, so that if a son will ask, not only this son, but you also as a son will ask, yep. for a, a fish, you won't give him a serpent. And I also put in my notes over there that a serpent is, is well, he said uh, in, in Corinthians uh, concerning, he said that I am worried that someone will move you and beguile you as the serpent did Eve to move away from the simplicity that's in Christ. Yep. That's why our ministry is a steady diet of feeding him Christ, because when you ask for a fish, don't give them a serpent. Don't move away from the simplicity that's in Christ. Don't give them formulas. Don't give them rocks. Don't give them snakes. And the third thing he says, if he asks for an egg, will he give him a serpent? And I, I put in my notes simply this, that an egg is really a, uh, a symbol of embryonic life. It's power. It talks about resurrection. But uh, a scorpion really has to do with what Corinthians 15 says. He says that, uh, you know, the sting of death is the law. Yep. So again, all of these things are pointing you away from an old covenant paradigm. So if you're asking for an egg, he's not going to give you back the law that's going to put you back under the sting of death. He's not going to make a death sentence over you. Yep. He's not going to give you the sting of death. And all of these things, the bread, the fish, and the eggs were stuff that was in the Sinai wilderness. The, 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 they said that this scorpion that it's talking about here would ball up and it would look like an egg. And, uh, and so they would reach down, think it was an egg, and find out it was a scorpion that would, uh, that would literally bite them. And I wrote also in my notes in Second Chronicles chapter 10, verse 11, there was a king that said, My father scourged you uh, with whips, but I'm going to scourge you with, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to scourge you with scorpions. And so uh, I connected those thoughts of those three things to we ask for eggs, and instead we get a whooping. You know, we go to church looking for answers. Instead, we get, we get, we get whips in, instead of, you know, task and serving. And what he's doing in all of these three things is he's pointing you away from that paradigm saying, yep. listen, a son asked for bread. We got bread. Yep. A son asked for fish, death, burial, and resurrection. We've got that. A son asked for an egg. He's not giving us the sting of death. Yep. And if he asks, we'll receive. We're just about out of time, man. I, this is powerful stuff. Uh, uh, tune in again next week. Take a moment, though, to call that number on the screen. We really do need your help to be able to take the gospel of grace and the gospel of the kingdom around the world. If you are enjoying our ministry, please don't sit on the sidelines. Become a partner with us. Help us share in uh, the giving and receiving so that we can continue to take the gospel around the world. Call the number on the screen or go to our website, give via credit card. God bless you. Thank you for joining in again this week. The word repentance means to change your mind. The message of John the Baptist and of Jesus was to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is accessed by a change in our thinking. If you are in outer darkness, there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That reality is not always out in the distant future. It is in people's lives right now. One simple mind shift can move you out of darkness and weeping and into light and rejoicing. God wants to wipe all tears from our eyes and replace our weeping with joy.